Thanks very much, Jana. Um, and there are lots of other folks in the room, too, that have had lots of experience with EOS, too. So um, Steve, I may call on you for questions. Uh, got Dave Stanley. Dave Stanley, yes, yeah. Uh, Tom Pratt has, has also helped me with this presentation. Tom uh, works a lot on American eels, and he's with uh, Fisheries and Oceans up at Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do is give you a little bit of information about the eels' life history. They range uh, from the Gulf of Mexico right up to Labrador. Actually, this past year there was one observed in the uh, Mississippi Ripper system, which used to be part of their range. Um, they're a catadromous species, meaning that they spawn in the Sargasso Sea, which is shown in the uh, diagram um, uh, to the lower right. And uh, then they, uh, or it's thought that they spawn there. <coughs> and then their young travel on uh, the ocean currents up to the fresh waters where they mature. And if you see those different circles around the sargasso, see those represent the size of the larvae. So the inner circle is 15 millimeters, the second is 30, and the largest one is out, outside of the limit. <coughs> and uh, I'll come back to that in a second. It's also thought that they are panmictic, meaning they're one genetic stock. Um, so uh, one update, for you that I found very interesting was uh, until now the evidence for eels spawning in the Sargasso was based on the size of the larvae as I explained uh, but um, there's uh, uh, some tagging work being done by Fisheries and Oceans in uh, Laval University out of uh, Quebec and uh, they've put backpack um, uh, receivers onto some eels, release them off Cape Breton, and track them to the northern edge of the Sargasso Sea. As you can see from, uh, there's no way to point at this, is there, Nick? No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so the little line um, on the upper diagram shows uh, the path of the eel going along the uh, coast of the, uh, uh, the coastal shelf and then going down to the Sargasso Sea. The bottom diagram um, shows that there are two different phases of the migration, one along the coastal, uh, coastal shelf, and then go, as it goes out into deeper water, the eel starts going up and down in these oscillations daily, uh, diving down to up to 600 meters. It's thought that this would uh, reduce predation on the, on the fish as they migrate. Um, the conservation status of the eel. There's not a huge update here other than uh, that the U.S. Uh, decided that listing of eels was not warranted uh, during 2015. Uh, so it is listed as endangered in Ontario and threatened in Canada. <clears throat> a couple of indicators that I wanted to point out to give you an update on. Um, uh, we have a Bay of Quinte trawling that you'll be hearing about later on from Jim Hoyle. And um, that'll give us an indicator of, of eels, yellow eels in that area. But then down at the Moses Saunders Dam, that is uh, where those two yellow or two blue arrows meet, uh, we have counts of eels moving upstream as in the eel ladders, and also counts of eels downstream as they move downstream. Uh, here's the Moses Saunders. Um, water flowing there and the eel ladder is pointed to uh, the OPG eel ladders on the Canadian side and NIPA ladder on the US side obviously. Um, here's their most recent trends. We uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s there was an average around 800,000 eels a year moving up. It declined dramatically uh, through the 90s to the point where there were only a few thousand coming up it's rebounded somewhat since then um, with the addition of the second ladder. Uh, but in the past couple of years, it has declined to a point where about 30,000 eels moved up uh, this past year. Um, and yes, Steve, US did beat Canada again. Um, and that's about uh, a, a very small proportion of our, our FCO target, which is uh, a million eels a year. Uh, the, yellow, the trends in the trawling, uh, as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side, uh, there used to be well over a couple of eels a, a trawl back in the 70s, and in recent years there have been very few eels 
caught. I think there was one this year and uh, zero the pre last year. Uh, now I talked to you a little bit about the silver eels. Uh, so this is the eels that are migrating downstream. They're called silver eels. And the only way out of the system is to migrate through the turbines at the hydro station. Some of them get uh, cut up uh, by the turbines, about 25% or less. And uh, those eels are counted, or some of those eels are counted downstream um, in an observational survey conducted by the hydro stations. And, um, and you can see in the upper graph the trend, um, if you focus on the red line, that's easiest to explain. Um, so back in 2000, there were about, uh, well, over 15 eels per, per survey day and it declined dramatically. So this is a very strong indicator that there are fewer and fewer eels leaving the system. Um, last year, uh, I think there were, depending on which survey you look at, there were about four, or um, only a couple of eels a day. Uh, but one thing that we've noticed over the, the past few years the, <coughs> is shown in the lower graph, and that is that the, um, the age in particular, which is shown by the blue line, has declined dramatically from uh, over 20 years of age, uh, so that the age is shown on the uh, right-hand bar axis. So over 20 years of age when they're at migrating out, and now they're down to less than 10 years of age. Um, one of the things that's being done to try to address the decline in eels is uh, OPG has a, an action plan, um, uh, annual investment of over uh, $500,000, um, and <coughs> it, the, there's uh, been two series of plans. Uh, we're currently in one that runs from 2013 to 2018. The plan consists of uh, <coughs> monitoring of eels that were stocked in the past, a trap and transport program, operation of the ladder, and operation of the tailwater survey, and then lastly, a focus on trying to reduce the mortality of eels as they migrate downstream. <coughs> so back to the stocking. Um, between 2006 and 2010, uh, 4.1 million glass eels, as they're called, uh, were captured out on the east coast in fisheries there and were translocated up in, into uh, Ontario. All the fish were stocked and they're put through a rigorous um, health assessment prior to release. Um, <coughs> these results are uh, the work that Tom Pratt has done in um, the upper St. Lawrence River and in the Bay of Quinte and it shows that on the upper graph it shows the density number of eels per hectare, uh, lower graph shows the biomass of eels and uh, <coughs> the eels have um, persisted very well, they've grown quite rapidly um, and uh, so that, that's very encouraging. One discouraging thing is that the, uh, um, the uh, oh, oh, sorry, in the past, some of the eels uh, were uh, um, developed into males as opposed to females, which were traditionally in this system, and those eels migrated out at a very small size. One disappointing thing is that we discovered a parasite, swim bladder parasite, it's until now been at a relatively low abundance, but uh, it's increased to 13.3% of the individuals we looked at had uh, the swim bladder parasite. Um, so we've, we've learned a lot from stocking. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is we had small males leaving the system. Um, and, and this picture in, uh, is shown here is the uh, historical phenotype of the eel that was seen in the, uh, in the silver eel fishery down in Quebec. And a, one of the small uh, migrants was shown beside it. Fortunately, in, in recent years, the eels seem to have been growing to a much larger size, which is what we would like to see. <coughs> um, a second component of the OPG Action Plan <laughs> they're working on uh, trap and transporting eels. So eels are still caught as a bycatch in the commercial fishery that's uh, conducted in Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence. And though their fishermen are not, not allowed to harvest them, but uh, they're paid a reward if they bring them to the, the Ministry of Natural Resources or to OPG. 
Uh, from there, they're picked up by a consultant and transported down to Montreal. Uh, and it's only the large eels we, we collect, ones that we feel are likely to migrate in the, next, in the near future. Uh, so they'll be, <coughs> they're moved around all those the dams <coughs> so that they can avoid that um, mortality during migration. It is possible to assess, the, the, uh, evaluate the success of this program because there is a silver eel fishery still present in Quebec, uh, big weir fishery down at the estuary. Um, <coughs> so I think I've covered all this already. Um, so here are the results uh, by year. Uh, we've had, in, in the red bars, are the results for the spring trap and transport above the dam. Uh, and then <coughs> the blue bars are the spring trap and transport in Lake St. Francis, which is the area just downstream of the Moses Sondre Power Dam. As you can see, there are a lot, it's a lot easier to catch eels at Moses Saunders. Uh, but we have been successful in catching some upstream. Uh, recently, we found that um, the fishermen were catching a lot of eels in the fall upstream, so we extended the program to include that. And, and the green bar shows uh, the results for 2015, so we caught almost 500 additional eels using that fall trap and transport. Um, uh, and, and the other thing to mention is this has been evaluated with tagging, so the eels are, uh, do seem to migrate out of the system towards the spawning grounds within a few years of release downstream. Uh, one other thing to mention is we, tagged, we uh, tag some of the eels with acoustic tags and released them at Glenora. And uh, we released... Uh, was it uh, seven on October 9th and six on October 14th, or maybe I got it reversed. But the idea was to try to see whether these eels moved downstream the way um, uh, all these eels were stocked eels, we feel, and to see whether they would, would migrate downstream. And on the um, y-axis here is the distance upstream or downstream from Glenora. So if the eels are moving towards the bottom of the graph, that means they're moving out of the system. And uh, the majority of the eels did move uh, out of the system. And in fact, our colleagues in Quebec uh, observed three fish in uh, <coughs> acoustic arrays down by Montreal. So they had traveled uh, about uh, 300 kilometers in, um, in that time period. <coughs> About the Eel Passage Research Centre, this is the other thing that OPG is doing, is, is contributing towards research to try to reduce the mortality of eels uh, in hydro turbines. Um, one of the things they did in 2015 is they investigated using um, electricity, vibration, electromagnetic force, or water velocity gradients to try to guide eels from one place to another, and this could be used to try to get eels towards a bypass, as it's hoped in the future. Uh, it was done in a large flume tank at Alden Labs. Um, the results were really quite difficult to evaluate, uh, although electricity and vibration did show some promise. Um, another activity was at the Iroquois Dam, uh, three different technologies were used to try to evaluate, uh, you know, could you detect eels in the wild? So that if you put some kind of behavioral stimulus on them, could you see if they reacted or not? And so they evaluated a split beam, um, hydroacoustics, um, a medium range, multi-beam uh, sonar, as well as a shorter range, um, like a Didson camera type uh, thing. And this was a really difficult experience because the, uh, the water velocities are normally um, one to two meter per second at the Iroquois Dam. They actually end up being higher than normal uh, during the time they deployed these things. And um, <coughs> there was a lot of debris in the system also. So they were able to uh, determine that eels uh, were there uh, based on the, uh, the shorter range multi-beam. Uh, but the other technologies were less successful. 